And then we learned that the variation of the Lagrangian is gives you equation of motion plus a boundary term that is very important. And this boundary term is a function of field and the variations, first order variation of the field. Okay. We also done at we have, first we have written this form d t uh, theta tilde to be theta alpha square root of minus g one by n minus one factorial because in space time it is n minus one form but space of variation it is what form one form okay okay and we have written it in this way this is my notation alpha mu two dot dot mu n and then the wedge product dx mu two wedge wedge okay and for general relativity general relativity we have done the calculation yesterday and we have shown that uh, is theta alpha this quantity is given by uh, 1 by 16 pi g let us keep these factors they are important then g alpha beta del mu <coughs> delta g mu beta minus g mu nu del alpha delta g mu This is something we have derived. Okay, we have also shown that we can derive this. This is symplectic, pre symplectic potential, and pre symplectic current, and then pre symplectic potential, and we call it. We define it right. If you remember that, let's call it like this: minus g and minus one factorial, and again. Alpha mu two mu n dx mu two wedge all the wedges mu n okay and this guy we have seen is given by uh, delta one square root of minus g theta alpha two remember my notation two means it's a function of the delta two phi and delta two for acting on phi minus uh, delta two and then uh, delta two and then what did i write square root of minus g acting on phi this should be here alpha okay okay this is something we have written in the last class if you remember it okay now of course we have shown that this guy has ambiguity and therefore this ambiguity comes into this guy also ambiguity means uh, the lagrangian you can add a total derivative okay a closed form but that does not change the equation of motion but that will change the theta as well as possibly change the other quantities. Okay, this is what we mean by ambiguities. So just by looking at variation, you may say theta is my uh, form, somebody will say theta prime is my form. They are related by certain relation related by the ambiguities. Okay. So we have seen that if I take this L goes to L tilde goes to L tilde plus d mu. If I take this ambiguity, then you can show that mm, this does not affect does not affect omega tilde is it clear it does not affect omega tilde can everybody see it it should not okay this is something you try to show okay it's trivial show it this is very easy you find if i last class we have defined if there is a total derivative if i add okay how the theta changes put it into there you see how omega changes and you will see they don't they they're same omega does not change okay 
please do this. It's two lines calculation. I will not do it. But what is important is that there is this another ambiguity. I can change it to y tilde. Okay. Okay. The symplectic potential itself is ambiguous because remember, I can always add a term dy here, but d square is zero. So therefore, it will not affect the actual equation. Okay. Now let's see if this freedom, you should be able to show that this indeed changes omega and omega tilde transform to omega tilde by a total derivative. Delta one, y two, tilde minus delta two, y one tilde. My notation is again the same. When I say, see, this is a function of phi and delta phi's. So therefore, y is also a function of phi and delta phi's. When I say y one, I y one, I means delta one phi. And when I say y two, I mean delta two phi. Okay, that's the same notation. I will follow. Okay. So these are the list of ambiguities which is going to affect this construction. Okay, and that's fine. But I should be able to show that at the end of the day, world entropy I calculate should not be affected by any of these ambiguities. That's very important. Okay, charges may depend on the ambiguities, but the physical conserved quantity is when I calculate integrated over surfaces. Okay, the ambiguity should drop. Okay, and you can already see something like that. For example. If I integrate this on a compact surface, this will not matter. Something you should be able to see these things will happen, but we'll do it more. Good. With this structure, we will define with this symplectic current. Okay, sorry, this is symplectic current. We will define what is called a pre uh, is again within bracket. Uh, this we call potential. Now, I think in one of the tutorials, we will show that how this guy is related to the Hamiltonian evolution. I think today or tomorrow, what do you plan? Tomorrow, okay. Because I will write down certain formula. Again, I will not, I give you motivation. I will not fully justify in the lectures. In the tutorial, we'll explicitly justify, just so that the pace I can cover more topics, okay. The word pre is again, last time I told you that these are all assuming that I should be able to coset out local degrees of freedom, redundant gauge redundancy, and obtain a non degenerate object. Okay. Now, this object is a covariant, it's a what form it is? N minus, N minus, N minus two. <laughs> this is still N minus one form. It's a two form because this I'm taking delta, I'm not taking D. So this is still N minus form in space time, but in space of variation, it is two form because you take delta one and delta two as its food. Okay. Now, what I want to do is that with this omega, sorry, omega, I want to create a scalar quantity. Okay. I have n minus one form. I want to create a scalar quantity. What is the easiest thing I should do? I will integrate on a n minus one surface. Okay. That's the easiest thing I should do. Okay. So therefore, let me write down this structure. I will denote this suffix sigma because presumably it could happen that this integration may depend on the choice of the surface. I cannot guarantee a priori. Okay. So I'll put uh, sigma. I'll write it as sigma. Sorry, let me give me a second. Better to write what are these functions of phi, delta one phi, delta two phi. This is defined as surface omega. Okay. So that means if I write it in terms of tensor notation, it will be something like omega dot n, omega alpha dot n alpha, where n alpha is the normal to the surface elements. Okay the directed surface element in uh, metric notation. Okay. So this is going to be a centrally important thing. This definition. Okay. We will write the relationship with this definition with the Hamiltonian evolution. 
very soon, okay? But remember this object. So what I did is that I have integrated over a surface, okay? And obtain this scalar quantity. In minus one form, I'll integrate on in minus one surface. Very good. I can always do that. Agreed? This is something I discussed in the previous class. Let me again do it. The structure that this is simplicity depends on the fact that this has to be generate, non-degenerate. If there are gauge redundancies in the system, it will fail to be non-degenerate. Okay, then I cannot call it symplectic structure. Okay, because it will generate fake evolution. It will not generate actual physical evolution. Because two states, two configuration separated by gauge transformation are same physical configuration. So what you have to do, if you look at Lee and Wall, they will tell you how to take coset, basically gauge out the degree, uh, remove the gauge degrees of freedom, and then only work with the physical phase space. It is not really, but something like a gupta Valla formalism, okay? But not really, okay? So therefore, in that case, only then if you can ultimately throw away all the bad degrees of freedom, which you don't want, okay? Then you will get a non-degenerate structure. And then you confidently call this is a symplectic structure. Before that, you cannot, because by definition, symplectic structure requires, remember the symplectic vector field definition we wrote, that this guy, D of this guy is equal to zero. Okay. That's the definition of a symplectic vector field, provided omega is non-degenerate. Okay. Good. Very good. Let's go ahead and carry on. So therefore, but here I am not showing how to take this procedure. I'll assume that this can be done and ultimately we have a symplectic structure. Okay. That surface on which I am integrating. Okay, so I will draw it immediately, okay? So think of, okay? By the way, so this is a space-time scalar, but what about this as in the space of variation again? Still a two form, okay? Remember that, delta one, delta two is still there. Good. So, so think of, I have this structure, something like this asymptotic structure, let's say asymptotically flat space-time, okay? I can think of surfaces, goes like this, okay? I can choose different surfaces, okay? Sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and so on and so forth, okay? So on this, each surfaces, these are hypersurfaces, I'm doing this integration. Now, let me write down this important, so I don't need this, maybe. Okay, this is obvious, okay? I write down important thing. Sigma Z surface is, independent, independent of the choice of sigma provided. Now this is very important that there are certain conditions fulfilled. I will be able to show that it does not matter which surface I integrate. I'll always get the same result. Okay, I think Jahanur has discussed a little bit on this. But today also probably he will uh, revise that thing. But this is very important, okay? So let me write down what are the conditions, okay? Because if it is related to ultimately Hamiltonian evolution, okay, I want it to be independent of the surface, okay? On which I am integrating, okay? Otherwise things will be weird, okay? So let's see. First condition is delta one phi and delta two phi. These variations are such that linearized field equations are covariant. Field equations hold. Okay, this is exactly what I think Jahanu discussed. Okay? That not only field equation, of course, configurations are all solutions of field equation. Linearized field equation hold. Second, very important. This guy is a Cauchy surface. Okay, we are working with a globally hyperbolic space time, Cauchy surfaces exist. Okay. Okay. And third, we will also require appropriate boundary condition. Great. Boundary condition. Condition. 
imposed on phi. These are also important, okay? I don't know what will happen that structure, but that structure will definitely will not be related to Hamiltonian. It will be some quantity, but what does it mean? I a priori cannot say, I have to look at it. But this structure will ultimately be related to the Hamiltonian. That's why we are doing this. Yeah. Sigma into closed surface means it's a n minus one form. It could have boundaries, okay? It will have boundaries. Then you have to put appropriate boundary conditions. That's why I took this uh, third point. Okay. okay. Any other question? Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, the d omega will not be zero. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So this is again we will discuss, but the Cauchy surface is extremely important. Without that, this is not going to happen. But this is a priori given because. We have told, of the first class we told you that we are working with a globally hyperbolic spacetime. One of the uh, definition of globally hyperbolic spacetime is that among all other equivalent definition that we have a Cauchy surface, okay? Huh? Cauchy surfaces are always spacetime. We are doing physics, okay? <laughs> because the definition of Cauchy surface is that a time-like curve cuts once and only once. So it has to be, uh, a causal curve, rather, it has to be space like by definition. Okay. In fact, uh, if it happens that at some point Cauchy surfaces become time like, then it means you are doing with pathological space time. Okay. Okay, good. So this structure is important and we'll continue with this structure. Okay. So let me again emphasize that there are ambiguities in omega small omega. Therefore, those ambiguities will percolate into ambiguities in capital omega. Okay. Obviously. So, therefore, for example, if you look at these ambiguities, at least the y ambiguities, this guy will transform because of the y ambiguities to same good old guy, sorry, phi, delta 1 phi, delta 2 phi, but then the other ambiguity, you can clearly see there is a delta D. So if I integrate it, I'll get by Stokes theorem values on the boundary. And the boundary, assuming the boundary are there, delta 1 y delta minus sorry, this should be 2 and delta 2. I urge you, look at the discussion in Wald and Iyer, some properties of the Northern Charge paper, where they discuss how to put boundary condition, appropriate boundary condition, asymptotically flat, appropriate boundary condition to get rid of this term. In fact, they will give you particular fall off condition required okay, to get rid of this term. Okay. Ah. What is that? So remember that this definition, phi, phi 2, did I? Why? Ah, remember why? Let's go back. I have an ambiguity in this theta. Where is my theta? Here. Okay. I can say the theta tilde and theta tilde plus d y bar both will give you the same variation because d square is zero. Right? So if I if you give me theta tilde, if somebody give me theta tilde for y, I'll not be able to distinguish it at the level of equation of motion, right? Agreed? So this is what I mean by ambiguity. So theta is ambiguous up to adding a form dy. That leads to an ambiguity in omega because omega is also a function of theta. Okay. So that ambiguity means here there is theta 2. Remember, I define theta 2 that theta tilde 2 equal to theta phi delta 2 phi and theta tilde 1 equal to theta tilde phi delta 1 phi. Okay. So I am taking variations delta 1 and delta 2 who commutes with each other. Okay. On those variations in the space of variations, I define this omega through this definition. 
Okay, where is the definition? Yeah. But ah. Okay. Okay, so delta one is the variations in the direction of remember that we define the space of parameters in the space of solutions to be direction by lambda one and lambda two. So you can go in lambda one direction or you can go in lambda two directions, two variations we call it delta one phi and delta two phi. And then you define this object as a two form on the space of variation. And then you define capital omega again integrated over this two form. So everything is a function of delta one and delta two. Okay. Now what I'm doing is that I am saying that, okay, these all came from theta, but my theta is ambiguous. So how this ambiguity percolate to the definition of capital omega and small omega. That's all what it is. And notation wise, y2 and y1 exactly means what they, because remember that this is a function of phi and delta phi. So therefore y is also a function of phi and delta phi. So when phi delta equal to delta one, I'm calling y to be y1. This is just a notation y equal to y2 means delta equal to delta 2. Okay. Clear? Okay. I'll be slow. It's okay to be slow. Okay. I mean, there's no need to thin out. Okay. It's okay to be slow and cover things. Okay. Good. Good. So this is the structure we will require to go ahead with something important, which is, so let me cover this thing. With this structure, what I will do is that I will look at construction of another charge. Okay. So I will distinguish diffeomorphism from active coordinate transformations, okay? I'm, I'm sure you know the distinguish between diffeomorphism, active and passive coordinate transformation. I require, I request if you not look at the world as standard reference for understanding what a diffeomorphism is. Very naively speaking, it is coordinate freedom, general covariance, but there are subtle differences, okay? So, so how do we characterize diffeomorphism? So I will take a vector field, okay? vector field on M. By vector field, of course, it means that it takes different, different values at different points of the manifold. And since it's a field, it's a function of X mu's, I can assume certain smoothness property. Well, I assume certain derivatives can be taken. Okay. Then, for diffeomorphism, you Morphism by xi a, I will denote the variation to be this. Okay. See, I can take arbitrary variations. Okay. But among certain variations, some will be diffeomorphism. Diffeomorphism means they'll give a one to one onto mapping from M to M prime such that my theory does not change. Okay. So on Whenever my variation is a diffeomorphism, sorry, I will call that variation to be del xi phi. Okay, this is my notation. Delta phi is arbitrary variation. Del xi phi is variation which are generated by diffeomorphism x goes to x plus xi. By the way, I should be careful, I'm only considering, uh, although in this mathematics it will not require, but for simplicity, let's consider only infinitesimal diffeomorphism. Okay. And I should be able to take diffeomorphism infinitesimal and denoted by this vector field psi, and then this is del psi phi. Okay. Now you tell me that an elementary result in calculus will tell you this will be generated by the lead derivative acting on covariant object. Right? It is the lead derivative which tells you lead dragging that if you move the mapping from M to M prime. Okay. And of course, there's a pullback involved, but let's think of this as just a lead dragged, okay. okay. Integral curves of the, yeah, but not a directionally. There's a lead derivative involved because there's a pullback to be there. Exactly. 
So therefore, I'm thinking of this as a lead rank. If it is a scalar, it does not matter. But if it's a vector, you have to be careful. Okay, you have to use the definition of lead vector. Okay, sorry, lead derivative. For example, if I have metric, I already know this structure. What is the structure? The lead derivative acting on metric. What does it gives you? This gives you the structure. I am sure you know that. These are different morphisms. Your physics should not change. So you should think of these transformations like a gauge transformations in gravity. Just like your know, fundamental field A, okay, goes to A plus grad lambda in electrodynamics. Okay. Here, corresponding transformations are your field G changed to G prime, which is G plus this Lie psi. And Lie psi is given by this. So these are gauge transformations for gravitational field. Okay. In gravitational wave construction, I'm sure you have looked at it. If I have eta mu nu on flat space time, and then on this flat space time, I have a SO13 tensor. Okay. Propagating on this flat space time. Okay. Which I call gravitational wave. Okay. Then I know that my theory is invariant under the gauge transformation, del xi h mu nu is del a, sorry, del mu xi nu plus del nu xi nu. Why here ordinary derivative? Because my background is it a mu nu. Okay. So everything I must ensure the definition of gravitational energy, definition of anything should be independent under this gauge transformation. Physical quantities cannot depend on gauge transformation. So an analogous non perturbative statement is actually this. Okay. This is my gauge transformations in gravity. So if I take one of the variations, okay. So now what I want to search, look at the celebrated Neuder theorem, which says that if I have a symmetry, okay, there are things which is conserved. Although for diffeomorphism, applying Neuder theorem is a bit tricky, but I will show that there exists a current which is closed, constructed from the variations which are diffeomorphism, and which is closed on shell. On shell means when equation of motions are applied. Okay, this word on shell comes an analogy to the particle physics. Okay, but we'll use it. Okay, the standard. Okay, so we will define an object which we'll call Neuer current. Okay. Not symplectic current, Neuer current. Okay, and the construction is this J. This is the Neuer current, the form which is. Theta tilde, the same theta tilde which we have. Remember, the theta tilde is a function of phi and delta phi. But I am only considering diffeomorphism. So, therefore, phi and first term. Okay. Then, what is the second, second term? I write it xi dot l tilde. Tell me what form j tilde is. N minus, N minus, N minus one. Okay. So therefore, look at the consistency. What form L is? N form. Xi dot L becomes N minus one form. And this is by construction and N minus one form in space time. Okay. Yeah. It's an interior derivative. I'm right because Xi is L is scalar. So therefore, I'm right. Okay. Ideally, if I'm considering this is the same thing because this is a top form. It will not matter. Yeah. D minus one form. That's what it is. Okay. Okay. So this is definition. Okay. With this definition, let us see whether this is del dj equal to zero, whether this form is closed or not. Okay. That is what we are going to prove. Let's go ahead and prove it. Okay. Good. Okay, so let's take the G tilde. I think I am I am able to convince you that the divergence equal to zero for ordinary vector currents is equivalent to dj equal to zero. 
I mean, that part I'm sure that, so we should be able to prove dj tilde equal to zero, okay? Good. So what is this object? So this will be clearly d theta tilde. I will write this, okay? And then minus d of, okay. Okay, clear? Good. Now, I will use this identity. Use this identity. It is easy to prove. I don't know, uh, Jahanur, are you going to prove it? This guy? Yeah, so I think we have already discussed it. But maybe you can little bit talk again today. Okay, if you remember, this is nothing but I integrate derivative and, and L remember is a top form. So therefore DL equal to zero. Okay, so you use this identity and then you will be able to write here. Let me write it using this D J tilde is equal to, I will say, uh, okay, I need also need to use this quantity. Let me write that. And this guy is also important. This guy. I will also use, uh, will also use uh, this thing that delta L tilde equal to E del xi del xi phi plus D Theta tilde phi del xi, okay. which is the just the variation result. Okay, these two results I will use it on dj, and immediately I hope you will be able to see that I should be able to write that del xi operating on l tilde is equal to e delta s of phi, sorry, delta xi of phi. And then this term, okay, I should be able to write, uh, sorry, I'll call it D, and I'll be able to write D theta tilde. Now it becomes this, uh, psi of phi, I replace deltas by Li. And therefore, together this, you can see, DJ tilde is nothing but E del xi of phi. Is that part clear? Everybody, is it clear what I did? Very simple. I took this object, this object, I replace it by L minus this. So if it L minus this and this equation is nothing but this, so this and Li of L cancels out, I only get that part. Is this clear? This requires infinitesimal diffuse. This, I think so, because I'm going to lead derivative from infinitesimal diffuse. This nothing will change here as long as we don't use this quantity. So this proof does not see whether I'm looking at large diffuse or small diffuse. Up to the level of this proof, everything is safe. The proof is still valid. That's what I'm saying. Nowhere I have used the word that there is a small or large different one. I only, yeah. Which definition? Yes. This is definition. Oh, this does not, this is still a little bit true. Okay. Okay, good. So is that proof, this part clear to everybody? I have not done. Is it clear to everybody what is going? Just manipulation. I replace this object from this, and then I replace this object from this, and that gives you this. Clear? Let me put. So this I replace from here, and this guy I replace from here. Okay. Okay. So now, 
on a shell when equation of motion holds. We are looking at pure gravity when equation of motion holds. I think today Jahanur is going to discuss, we have going to give a tutorial on electromagnetic field, right? So there we will construct this some of these quantities, that is theta and small omega. Okay, that will be interesting to gravity also we we have already done for gravity examples okay okay on shell when equation of motion holds e is equal to zero okay and therefore we obtain d j tilde equal to zero so this is a closed form for variations j deform of z okay okay is that clear this will not work for arbitrary thing. Why? Because I have to take lead derivative. This definition. Okay. So you have to do for diffeomorphism. Okay. Is that part clear? Okay. So we found a current which is conserved on shell for variations which are diffeomorphism. Okay. We will call this current the Neuer current for diffeomorphism, obviously. Okay. Now. Of course, I found this is a closed form. Okay. That doesn't mean it's the exact form, at least globally. Okay. Obviously. Ah. As I told you that the word pre symplectic manifold is only a word for B. Okay. I will assume that this symplectic structure can be consistently defined by modulo all the gauge transformations in the theory. Yeah, but that thing and these things are different. I have all, I have to define the presence of local symmetries will make this object to be degenerate. I have to take care of that and find a non-degenerate version of it. Suppose I find it, okay? Then I can still construct a current for diffeomorphism. Okay, but the fact is that I have to use the good thetas and good omegas. Because I need a symplectic structure in the phase space. So for the our time being, we will not waste time there because this is mathematically more involved. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. No, the assumption is that I will be able to remove this word P and found a degenerate structure for sigma, uh, omega sigma. That is one issue. But I can still define this theta. There's absolutely no problem in defining theta on space time as well as in the space of diffeomorphism. So, therefore, this definition does not matter whether I'm working with pre or unpre. The pre or not pre depends on whether I'm looking at Hamiltonian evolutions or not. That will come later, okay? So up to this, we don't have to worry about. This is a classical construct, simple construction, okay? That part will come when we'll discuss capital omega. So this structure will simply go through. Good, okay? So dj tilde equal to zero does not mean globally, because there will be topological obstruction that G tilde is an exact form. J tilde is an exact one, but we will use what is called the Poincare lemma. And what does Poincare lemma says? What it says is that every closed, every closed <coughs> P form, on an open ball, on an open ball in Rn, okay, is exact. This is like saying, if I have curl E equal to zero in electrostatic, locally, I'll always be able to write down E as a grad of phi. Globally is a very non-trivial question. In a, in a complicated manifold, which is not Rn, 
there is there will be topological obstruction in writing down a completely globally defined potential everywhere and i'm sure that you have heard of magnetic monopoles and things like that but okay let me not go there okay since a manifold is always locally rn locally i should be always able to write down an exact form for j globally everywhere is not not be valid okay there will be homological construction uh, which we don't want to go into this okay but if it is a open ball in rn i should be always able to write j tilde equal to d some q okay such that was that dj tilde okay so that means i'll be able to calculate a potential for the northern current what form j tilde is n minus 1 form then phi is in space time n minus 2 form so therefore this is what we call sorry q sorry not phi i call it q is what is called neither potential this will be the quantity which will ultimately directly related to the black hole entropy it is not only related to black hole entropy this is the neither charge of several different morphism and this will be related ultimately modulo certain extra term to the absorbed quantities in space time okay this is central object which is important okay so all this construction is very good we obtain what is a noether potential but again this is not very useful unless we have a explicit example without the explicit example we will not be able to understand this construction so what now i will do is that i'll go back there and start for gr where i know already the result construct what is j and what is q explicitly okay because then things will be clear at least behind this cut and what is going on okay so let's go ahead and do it so i would require this to let it be there i will go and do it up here okay okay so what is our motivation our motivation is we like to construct like to construct right j tilde and q tilde or or general relativity see in principle if i give you any theory as long as the theory is diffeomorphism invariant okay the lagrangian has diffeomorphism invariant i should be able to construct this correct okay but gr is a simplest example which is what is most interesting okay so let's see so calculation a lot okay i will have j tilde equal to theta tilde into okay this is what i have to calculate let's write it down what is this object okay square root of minus g i'll use all these definitions written here square root of minus g tilde right n minus 1 factorial alpha mu 2 mu n okay dx mu 2 which which dx mu n let it be then i have this object r l tilde is r into r and volume form right l tilde for gr so therefore i will have this structure square root of minus g capital r by 16 by g okay and then alpha alpha mu 2 mu n Okay, and then I will have d x mu two which which sorry I would require this stuff. 
Give me a second. In the meantime, you look at this expression. Okay. Much better. Okay. okay. So this is the structure we start with J. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and do more. Now what I'll do, I'll put theta alpha, this quantity to there. Let's go ahead and do it. Remember that uh, earlier theta alpha was defined for arbitrary variation delta, but while the construction of J, I only require diffeomorphism. Okay, so everywhere I have delta, I'll replace it by lead derivative. So this guy is square root of minus G 16 by G one by N minus one factorial. And then what do I get? I have, I take this guy common, this alternative tensor, mu N dx mu two, which, which, Mun. Then I write this structure coming from here would be uh, G alpha beta G mu nu L nu Li of xi G beta mu minus del beta Li of xi G mu. Nu. Okay. And then I will have minus R. Agreed? Everybody, please look at the structure. What I did is that I, instead of theta alpha, I put the entire thing, but this variation I substituted by lead derivative. Okay. Because this guy is a function of phi and Lisa of phi. Okay. Clear? Is it clear? Or it is there. No, but theta alpha, there is a n minus one factorial that now here there will be, right? I think I missed it. Sorry. Yeah, it should be there. Because that has to be there in very definition. Good. Okay. Okay. Now what? Long time to go. Okay. So what should I do since this is diffeomorphism? I will say del xi of G alpha beta equal to del alpha xi beta plus del beta xi alpha. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and write it. What is this object? I'll put everywhere this quantity. Okay. So what I'll do is that this quantity, this entire thing, is there another color? This entire thing. Look at that, it has only one free index, alpha. Okay. okay. So I will denote this guy as something alpha. Okay, otherwise I'll go mad every time I have to write it. Okay. So therefore I'm call it this way. Only that part. Okay. So to emphasize it. the same color. Okay. okay. So let's go ahead and write it. What is this object is? So therefore, this object is then G alpha beta G mu nu. Okay. Then again bracket del nu del beta. This is beta mu xi mu plus del mu beta okay then I have uh, this object minus del beta del mu by mu 
plus the mu. Okay, this object minus R. Agreed. This is the thing which we'll want to work with. Okay, clear. Let's go ahead. Okay. So what I will do is that let's look at this term and look at this term. Okay. Let's combine these two terms, first and the last. Okay. And I will write it G alpha beta G mu nu. Okay. And then L nu L beta psi mu minus L beta del nu psi mu. Is obvious why I have chosen this because I will see a curvature coming, right? Because this is anti symmetric covariant derivative acting on commutator of the derivative acting on a vector field psi mu. So, therefore, there is a structure curvature coming. To get that, I have chosen in this way, okay? And the rest of the term, unfortunately, does not give something so that easy. But what it does is a plus the other term, this guy. And this guy will give you G alpha beta G mu nu, okay, and then del nu, del mu, del nu, uh, del mu is psi beta, okay, and then and I will have this guy minus psi del beta del mu psi, okay. And then I also have minus R psi R. Okay, all the structures we have written explicitly. Okay, it is clear what should I have to do here because this is commutator of the covariant derivative acting on a vector field. So, therefore, I will use the definition of the curvature, and then this guy is alpha beta e mu nu. This is anti symmetric, so I first write R. Let me use my notation gamma, psi gamma, and then beta mu. I will write nu beta here, and this mu comes here. Okay, that's the convention I will follow. Okay. Okay. Here, I mean, sometimes you may use another convention. Okay. Go ahead and work it. I'll follow this convention. And then here, what should I get? I get uh, this guy will give me uh, xi beta and therefore box of xi alpha and the other term will give me minus uh, del alpha and then I will have del mu xi mu minus r. Agreed? Everybody is in agreement? Okay. Now what I'll do is that I will take curvature terms in one direction. You see what will happen. This is mu nu and g mu nu. So this will give me the Ricky scalar, right, Ricky tensor. Okay. So therefore I will have term like g alpha gamma xi gamma minus r xi alpha curvature dependent terms plus Box psi alpha minus L alpha. Agreed. Okay. Let's go slow. There is no need to go fast. Okay. Good. So we already have our structure. Okay. Now what should we do? This current is conserved only on shell. That means we have to use equation of motion on this expression of current. What is the vacuum equation of motion for general relativity? RAB equal to zero and R equal to zero. So therefore, using using vacuum Einstein's equation, Einstein's equation. Equations which is R alpha, sorry, R is distorted, R alpha beta 
equal to r equal to 0. Peckham Einstein's equation says not only r is 0, but also r alpha beta is also 0. Okay. Okay. If r alpha beta is 0, obviously r is 0. Okay. okay. Good. Note that only r equal to 0 is not Einstein's equation. Okay. You have to put r alpha beta equal to 0. So, what happens to the first two terms? They vanish. Okay. You may actually see that if there is a matter, there will be contribution from the energy momentum tensor of the matter, and there will be new terms from the other charge acting on the matter because matter Lagrangian will also depend on covariant structures. Okay. All together will make things. If you are interested in knowing how to look at the effect of matter, please look at this uh, paper by. Wald and Gao. I, uh, I don't remember which year it is, but it is, I think, in P Physical Review D. Okay. But the uh, title of the paper is Physical Process First Law. Okay. Do look at it. It's a very nice way. There's all these charges are constructed, taking matter into account. Okay. Because what they're looking at, charged particle falling into a charged black hole. Okay. So therefore, they will require matter. But for us, we'll only use the full pure gravity equation. It does not matter. Matter does not matter. And therefore, we have the ultimate what we have wanted to calculate. This object and this object, alpha is equal to box. Our job is done. Okay, we got J alpha. Okay. Now, what is quite interesting? Let's write down what is this J alpha. Okay. So let us call uh, this object. Now let us give it a name. We call it J alpha. Okay. Just give it a name. Okay. It has one index upwards. Okay. Now look at what is happening that okay little bit different so not this one we define this is of course okay let's define j alpha just for convenience with a 16 pi g okay it will be later useful for me this 16 pi g which is there i'll absorb into this object and call it j alpha it will be useful for me later. That's why I'm writing. Good. Now let us try to understand what is this object, J alpha. Let's see. This is like 1 by 16 pi g. Let me write it this way. J mu goes as del mu xi alpha, okay, minus xi alpha xi is it clear? Thankfully, this minus sign comes. Okay. It's important. Okay. Okay. Now, it is clear that I can write this J alpha. Now, what I can do is that, is this clear how it came? Can you see this? If I take it inside, I don't get this. What I get is that I have to take, so think of this term. If I take it inside, I'll get del mu del alpha xi mu, which is not this. Still, I can write it. Why? Huh? R is zero. R mu nu is zero. Okay. So there also I have used Beckham Einstein's equations. Okay. So therefore, I can flip this object. Okay. Okay. Clear. Okay. So let me go ahead again. So what we have. Uh, interesting structure that J alpha I define to be del mu J mu alpha, where J mu alpha is, you see, with the 1 by 16 pi g, 16 pi g, and it gives me this is the time. L mu xi alpha. Okay. 
Yeah. So as an example, suppose I take xi alpha to be the killing vector. Okay. Okay. Then this is definitely non-zero. Okay. It's clear that this is an anti-symmetric form. I can construct out of killing vectors. Okay. Suppose instead of if you want to like take lead derivative across the killing vector, generate time translations in GR, right? There are also these objects are very nicely defined objects. Okay. We'll take two minutes break and we'll watch. So this is straightforward derivation. Okay. Good. So let's point it out. This is important, which you are going to use later. So therefore, my uh, J form, where is my J form? Where did I wrote it? Yeah, J form. I can write it now this way. So what I'll do is that generally what we'll do is this convention I'll call. Tell me J alpha. Index is divergence is on the second index. So I'll get a minus sign. That is what I will solve. Okay. So let's see. So j tilde is then equal to minus square root of minus g del mu j alpha mu. That gives me this minus sign, which will be useful later. And then I have one by n minus one factorial alpha mu two mu n. This is the alternative tensors dx mu 2 wedge wedge dx mu n okay okay and this with the square root of minus g i can further write minus del mu minus g alpha mu 1 by n minus 1 factorial again alpha mu 2 dot 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 mu n and dx mu 2 which, which. okay my construction for j is done okay now what should i do i should look at q it is clear that i will be able to find q because j is already divergence of a anti-symmetric two tensor okay so therefore q can be found just by observation okay do you want me to calculate q <laughs> i'll write it <laughs> Well, let me write the expression. Q will be, remember, uh, n minus 2 form. Okay. So let me write down the expression. Maybe uh, last tutorial, maybe we can do it. Or, okay. Okay. So, well, I mean, it's not, there is little bit subtle thing because when you write here, the, sorry, here there is a n minus 1 factorial. When you write Q in the definition of n minus two form, there will be n minus two factorial. So you have to relate, you, can, you have to bring out that Q from this structure. Okay. So there's a little bit of work, okay, just tensor manipulation in this manipulation. But nevertheless, I don't want to remove this. At the end of the day, you can show Q can be written as. Because I have taken this definition, I have taken this inside, but that's all. Yes, but this is anti symmetric tensor, it's a very special tensor, it will work out for that. The gamma's contribution will be zero, of course. In general, you cannot write, but this is anti symmetric. So, so, so then show that, show that capital Q tilde, which is so that G, J tilde equal to D of Q tilde and capital Q tilde, which is defined because it's in minus two form. I call it capital Q mu three dot 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 mu n. Oh. 
okay okay and this quantity q mu 3 dot 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 mu n you can show this object will be by the way is it clear that one thing you can clearly see that this will be something proportional to first derivative acting on psi that's clear q will be so this form will be equal to minus this minus sign is important 16 pi g okay epsilon so therefore epsilon is square root of minus g into that alternative tensor which i wrote as square bracket alpha beta u3 un then please do it okay show that this is in the okay this will be the structure of the noether potential so this is we call noether current noether current for diffeomorphism even alpha alpha in gr and this is not a potential all these quantities will be of fundamental importance okay when we will calculate black hole entropy okay one way to check this is t you actually calculate the d here okay of this object and show that this is j okay that's easy to see only thing that n minus 2 factorial thing you have to little bit take care of okay so this structure we'll keep it in mind now i have a few minutes but uh, let me start a little bit of the arbitrary variations thing okay any questions on this okay or i'll go to a little bit different thing okay this will not work this will not make any difference because that's like adding something and it will not contribute to the what should i say uh, question of theta because this is g alpha beta what will change is asymptotic conditions okay that will be non trivial and if you want to ask somebody here in the next part jan will go and ask him okay this phd thesis was based on that okay see remember so what do you want very simply speaking you want observables to be gauge invariant right and you then you can show that things like pseudo tensor integrated over a slice these are or all these quantities gauge invariant require certain kind of asymptotic conditions those will be completely different because the asymptotic structure is different from let's say de sitter is completely different from that of the uh, asymptotic flat infinity okay so therefore the asymptotic infinity having different structure you have to be careful in putting proper diffeomorphism boundary conditions and blah blah but this can be done people have already done it okay, okay. the conserved charges this is can be different okay. good so let's go ahead okay so what we have learned let me uh what should i do i start today okay now what so let us go back to our original result we have delta by tilde e delta phi e theta tilde phi okay. this quantity you remember okay and what we have shown that we have j tilde is equal to theta tilde but j is only for diffeomorphism so therefore phi leaves i of phi minus i dot l okay 
okay? Which is just I, is I, written in this way, okay? Okay? Now, what I want to now see, okay, I have all this construction and everything. I want to do an arbitrary variation of this noether current. What do I mean by arbitrary variation? Noether current already depends on the one variation, which is diffeomorphism. It's a function of least i of phi. I want to do another variation of it. But this time, this variation is arbitrary, not diffeomorphism, okay? It could be a real change in the space time, okay? So I want to define this object, delta of psi. So this is ultimately going to give us the first law, Hamiltonian as well as the first law, okay? Today it will not, tomorrow it will, okay? So what will be this structure? This structure will be delta of phi tilde, sorry, theta tilde, phi, lisa i of phi, minus, uh, Xi, of course, xi is a space-time quantity. This will not change. And therefore, I will have E delta phi plus D theta tilde. But note that this theta is a function of phi and delta phi. This is not a function of least i of phi. Because this delta j act on delta L, this delta is arbitrary. So this theta is then therefore, so therefore, in the throughout the calculation, I'll keep the arguments of theta. It is important, okay? Otherwise, it's not clear, okay? This theta depends, this theta came from definition of j. So therefore, this theta depends on Lie of phi. This theta came from variation of the Lagrangian. Since I am doing arbitrary variation, this theta depends on delta of phi. Okay, note that, little bit notational complication, but please remember it, okay? Good. Let's go ahead. Delta of theta tilde phi lies i of phi. Let it be. And this I will write minus, okay. Uh, I will use equation of motion. We'll call xi dot d theta tilde phi. Okay, using equation of motion e equal to zero. Okay. Let's go ahead. Okay. This equation d of theta tilde xi. Remember my early formula. Did I remove it? This got a cotton magic formula or whatever. I can write this as nothing but delta of theta tilde phi li xi of phi minus this will be li xi of theta tilde phi delta phi plus t xi dot theta tilde phi. Okay. I hope you remember that formula that li xi of L I have used a formula. I'm using the same formula for li xi of theta tilde. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, look at this structure. This structure is delta xi, delta theta, and this variation is delta xi or li xi. Okay. This is li xi acting on here and delta acting on here. So if you remember, this is nothing but omega, small omega, where delta 1 is delta and delta 2 is li xi. Clear? So therefore, I identify that tilde is equal to uh, omega, which is a function of phi, delta phi, and li xi of phi. Be a little careful on the notations. Plus d xi dot theta tilde phi, delta phi. I hope the phi's and thetas are distinguishable, okay? And the board, right? I hope I'm not messing with the handwriting, okay? Good. Okay. One thing, let us do a very simple thing, okay? 
at least for today's class, but we will do more elaborate on this structure. Suppose I am looking at xi to be one of the killing factor, isometries of this theory. That means suppose xi is an isometric, isometric, a killing direction. So what will happen if it is a killing direction? The Lie derivative along the killing direction of covariant object will vanish, right? Agreed? So what will happen to omega then? If this is zero, omegas are linearly dependent on this derivative. So omega will, what will happen? Yeah, so what will happen to omegas? It is always there. Look at the, our construction. Yeah, did I, did I miss anything? Oh, sorry. What will happen to omega? Anybody? So they are linearly dependent on de Lie derivative of xi and its derivatives. If the Lie derivative, if it is isometry, Lie derivative of phi is zero, what will happen to omega then? Can it be non-zero? It will be zero. The omega will also vanish, right? So therefore, if one way, you know, would be look at the gr omega. Do we have the gr omega? We have it, right? No. Just put xi to be a killing vector to see what will happen. Okay. Good. So this will vanish, will imply omega phi del phi is i of phi. Okay. Okay. Then what will happen? We will have a very interesting relationship that delta j tilde minus d of xi dot theta tilde phi delta phi. Again, let me emphasize this theta tilde is depends on arbitrary functions of phi. You can't throw it away, okay? Equal to zero. Or delta dq tilde minus d xi dot theta tilde. Let me every time keep this argument because it is important equal to zero. Okay. Okay. Now I leave it to you to show if the linearized equations are true, I'll be able to shift this. Okay. I'll be able to exchange theta and delta. This requires linearized equation to be valid. Okay. It is cannot by definition is not a function. It's a, always depends on linearly del xi and del z variations. Okay, so therefore, this one. So therefore, this with linearized equation, linearized equation of motion will be d delta q tilde minus xi d xi dot theta tilde phi delta phi. Okay. I can integrate this object on a surface sigma, okay, which may or may not have boundaries. And then I will have, suppose I integrate it on a surface sigma, suppose sigma has boundaries, okay. So think of a surface which start from, let's say, this is the structure, let's say, of the domain of outer communication. Here, there could be black holes. Okay. Okay. Then let's say I have a structure, something that goes like this. Okay. And where does it have boundaries? One boundary is at I naught, and other is this cross section of the future horizon with the surface. So this is again a two surface. So this is a two surface, this is a two surface, and this is a three. I mean, Co dimension two surface because I'm working with n dimensions and this surface is therefore co dimension one surface or n minus one dimension surface. Clear? In that case, I have an equation yeah, here. Boundary delta Q tilde 
Check. This is zero. This is a perfectly well defined quantity. This is integration over n minus two surface. Q is a n minus two form. Everything is absolutely well defined. Okay. Here, theta tilde is n minus one form. Xi dot tilde will be n minus two form. And therefore, I'm integrating on a n minus two dimensional surface of the co dimension one, co dimension two cross sections of this surface sigma. Okay. So this is going to play an extremely important role. Okay. To our construction. Today, I'm not going to do that. In fact, this is going to, we are almost close to the first law. But before I go to the first law, I have to take care of this quantity and define what is called Hamiltonian of this theory, which definitely I don't have the time today. So I'll end a little early because I don't want to complete a new topic. Okay. So I'll stop here today. Okay. And the next class, what I will do is that this I will keep with this definition. Okay. Integrating it, I will define what is called the Hamiltonian evolution for this theory. Once I define the Hamiltonian evolution, see if I integrate it, you see that I will get capital omega. Okay. And that will be related to the Hamiltonian evolution of the theory. Okay. And then I will analyze the asymptotic parts, parts at infinity. And I'll show for different. So if it is a time lag killing vector, okay. If I go to an infinity, what are the choices? Suppose I'm looking at asymptotic infinity is asymptotically flat. What are the killing vectors I have for Minkowski space? I have a time lag killing vector, which is of course the time. Okay. But I could also have rotational killing vector phi, which is not time like, but still a killing vector. So I will construct the value of this integral at infinity or particularly this value of this integral at infinity, because one of the limit is at infinity and show for different choice of the killing vector. If I take Zaya's time killing vector, I will get the ADM mass. And if I choose Xi as the angular killing vector, phi alpha, I'll get the ADM angular momentum. Okay. Or rather the variation of those quantities. Okay. In the thing. Okay. And that will tell me that how, so look at how non-local this object is. What is showing you that the ob, a thing evaluated here, a variation is equal to the thing evaluated at infinity. Okay. Okay. So therefore what, this is a very, non-local way of saying, although not really non-local, what I mean is that a quantity defined variation defined at the horizon, cross sections of the horizon is related to the ADM quantities, variations of the ADM quantities and infinity. This is why we call it the stationary version. We will see the first law which coil is called the stationary version of first law where the variation of the horizon area will be related to the variation of the ADM masses or ADM quantities, but those are naturally in general relativity, you can define only at infinity. And the very fact that the Hamiltonian will be ultimately given by a boundary term at infinity is related to the fact that I'm working on a diffeomorphism invariant theory. The uh, bulk Hamiltonian has to be zero. Okay. Hamiltonian will only be dominated by the boundary term, but okay, I'll not elaborate on more on this. You can look at world uh, general relativity textbook when he talks about three plus one decomposition and the Hamiltonian formulation, also uh, the uh, Poisos toolkit where he talks about the structure of constraints. Okay, I'll stop here. Next class will be our Hamiltonian plus the first law. Thank you. Okay, we can discuss anytime.